Next on BYUSN, the Cougars 5-0, and and the national narratives surrounding them continue to flourish. But which narratives are we actually willing to buy into at this moment? Plus, head football coach Kalani Satake describes BYU's style of play this season as aggressive. Do all of you agree? Speaking of the coach, he goes one-on-one -on -one with Spencer. About how BYU wins the bye week and stays undefeated. Can you stay undefeated by not playing? I think you can. Uh, and his early impressions of Arizona, which is in two weeks, and today's Top 5 Tuesday features the five biggest plays from BYU's 5-0 start. Yes, win the bye week. Priority number one. They're undefeated for at least 12 more days. Welcome to BYU Sports Nation, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Happy October! Love October. Me too. It's the best. Greatest time of year, in my opinion. Fall colors, especially in the Intermountain West. Halloween. Absolutely. I am Spencer Linton, alongside a man who can appreciate, speaking of Halloween, a snack, and specifically breakfast snacks, Dave McCann. Let's talk about Pop-Tarts. <laughs> Uh, our friend Brett McMurphy, who was on this show all the time, uh, tweeted out his bowl projections yesterday. Uh, they change week to week. And he has BYU in the Pop-Tarts Bowl against Notre Dame on the 28th of December. Now, if that were to hold up... That would be amazing! That would be awesome. It would also be the richest payout yeah. in the history of BYU football at $6 bucks uh, for the Pop-Tarts Bowl. So... Buy all the Pop-Tarts you want, eat them up, whatever. It, it, BYU's on track for, if not the Pop-Tarts Bowl, some other key <laughs> significant games that no one saw coming yeah. five weeks ago. I saw an Alamo Bowl in there, a college football playoff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's, it is wild right now. We'll get to that in a moment. Yeah. And the beauty to, to remember is this isn't us putting that up there. These are outside people who didn't graduate from this place, don't work for this place, have no emotional connection yes. to this place. Yes. And what they're saying this week about BYU on the first day of October is off the charts. Notre Dame as an opponent in the Pop-Tarts Bowl? Come on. I need all of you, by the way, to do me a favor. Dave told us this morning that he maybe has never tried a Pop-Tart before. So we suggested classic <laughs> frosted strawberry as the initial. You need to send him other submissions for the first Pop-Tart that Dave should try. I, yeah, you know, I'm not a Pop-Tarts guy, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm all in on the Pop-Tarts bowl. I'm with you there. I'm with you there. <laughs> Help Dave out. Send him some unforgettable flavors uh, so that he can try it and start it out the right way. Yeah. All rise and shout. Much to discuss in What's Trending. This is awesome. Yes. Hey, he went 5-0, baby. Let's go. Power powerful win. In a 5 0 start. Their wins are sound, solid football. Cougs are 5 0! And no other college football team can say that at this point. What's trending presented by BYU Food to Go, the MVP of your next event? Not sure if you grasped that in the 17 second video we just showed you. Uh, clearly, but BYU is 5 0. And Jerem's off getting treatment. <laughs> That's what I saw in that video. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you decide what kind of treatment. <laughs> yes, the Cougars are unbeaten. Five games, five wins, number 17 in the AP poll with an impressive resume to say the least. The Cougars starting to receive, not surprisingly, some national recognition, which you and I were just talking about, yep. Dave. And we're going to present three national narratives from notable college football figures and personalities that we find downright interesting, albeit sound blue goggled. First, Andy Staples, again, not from BYU fans. He's from On3. He projects that BYU right now is a college football playoff team and would receive a bye to the Fiesta Bowl in the college football playoff semifinals. So the Cougars await the winner of Texas and UNLV in that 5-12 matchup as the four seed. That's Wild. fantastic. <laughs> Why not? Also, ESPN's Football Power Index has BYU with a 24% chance to make the playoffs. So Andy's basing it off some of those metrics, I'm sure. Okay, number two, Dave. Yahoo Sports' Ross Dellinger currently ranking BYU as the sixth best team in the country mm. by resume, saying, quote, Couple the Baylor win with victories at SMU and against Kansas State, and the Cougars have a pretty strong resume thus far. Yeah. And last but not least, metrics guru Kelly Ford currently has BYU as the favorite 
to make the Big 12 championship game and projected to play Iowa State. Ooh. And the winner of that single afternoon is going to the college Auto football bid. playoff. Auto bid and a first round bye. Yeah, that's what he's saying. Amazing stuff. So these three nationally driven narratives, and some of them based largely in metrics, have BYU doing something that nobody thought was possible outside of maybe the coaching staff, some of those guys in that locker room, but certainly the general consensus, the outside fan base, the outside not so much fan base, didn't think BYU was going to do something like this, but here we are. So Dave, of the three narratives that you and I just presented, BYU is a college football playoff team as the four seed getting a bye. BYU is the sixth best team in the country by resume. Or BYU will face Iowa State in the Big 12 title game. Which of those national narratives are you most willing to embrace at this moment? Well, uh, let's, let's look at reality. <laughs> um, and again, these are the outside opinions, which which why we're fascinated about it. Because five weeks ago, BYU wasn't on the radar of anything. I, I've got an article in the Deseret News today calling BYU the October surprise for college football. Fair. You know, election season, there's always an October surprise that gets everybody going, oh, I didn't see that coming. BYU is college football's October surprise. Yes. So I think they're on track to get to the Big 12 championship game, which means they need to take first or second place. And you look at who's coming to Provo, Arizona, Oklahoma State, Kansas, three contenders coming sure. into the season, all three very good, all three capable of beating BYU straight up, all three vulnerable and don't look like superheroes. And they're coming to Provo. And then Houston. At 9-3, and three, if you win your home games, 9-3, and three, you never know what's going to happen in this league, but there are going to be more losses for more teams, right? And, and it could come up to, can BYU take first or second and get to Arlington and then go from there? Uh, realistically, yeah, the can, path is right there. Can BYU finish 7-2 and two in league play? And steal one of those road games, either at UCF, at Utah, at Arizona State. Right now, BYU is a favorite at Arizona State. And these pundits from outside of Provo, they're saying, why not? As they make their projections, well, why not BYU? I'm going to put them in the college football playoff. I think if you can route Kansas State, who was a conference contender, and then you defend your home turf, which historically you've been able to do, from the outside world, they're going, you know what, BYU's better than any of us thought, and now the schedule is favorable for yes. them to get there. Answer me this. What has BYU shown all of you to make you think that this is impossible, that these national narratives are way too unrealistic? What have they shown you through five games to make you think it's impossible? And then I would counter with this. What have all of BYU's future opponents shown you to make you think that they are world beaters and there's no way that BYU could compete with or even win games against all of those opponents? I think you know where I'm going with this and why I feel so confident in saying that BYU will win at least nine games at this point. They got to five. They're going to win at least nine. Now it's me wondering, can they get to ten and then, like you, sneak into, find a way into that Big 12 championship game. Remember that theme we had in August where it was like, well, if, if they could do that, if they could start 3-0, then why couldn't they win the fourth game? If you beat Kansas State, well, why can't you beat anybody else? Um, instead of, oh, Earth, we need to move the Earth, Moon, and Stars to, to get some good fortune and, and win one of these games on a Hail Mary. Now, BYU lined up and went head-to-head, -head, nose to nose, pound for pound, and blew out Kansas State. Uh, and they were 13th in the country. And, and you go back to the narrative. If you can do that, why can't you go to Central Florida and do to Central Florida what Colorado just did to them on their home field, which was also a huge surprise. Sure. Because Central Florida looked like the behemoth. Yeah, UCF was a 14-point favorite in that game. And now they looked like they're beatable just like everybody else. So why not? Why not? Why can't be why you go there and win the turnover battle and beat them? Whereas a couple of weeks ago, it was like, oh, man, that's yeah, yeah. got to go to South Florida. Uh, and now it's like, huh. Well, maybe they can. And if you get to nine wins, why can't you why, get to Why ten? can't you find a tenth? If you build that momentum. Momentum is such a powerful thing in sports. Ask BYU basketball last season. Right. When they built some momentum and it was like, whoa, they have dramatically overachieved. <laughs> BYU football is on the same path, Dave. And we get Cougar fans uh, and many watching this show and listening going, I want to believe that. 
But I've been disappointed. I've been hurt so many too many times. times. And it's like, yeah, it's sports, get over it. PTSD. The pain is part of the process. Um, That's why I tell people to enjoy the moment. Enjoy exactly. this. Be present in being in the top 20, which no one saw coming. Uh, and even as we're projecting a seven win season earlier before the season began, people are like, you guys are nuts. Well, maybe we are nuts, but not about this. Mm. Uh, and as it's played out, to the team's credit, they're sitting right here. And all these outside Utah pundits are going, hey, why not the playoff? Why not the Big 12 championship? What have they seen from BYU that leads them to believe they can't do it? Clearly nothing. That's the thing. Yeah. But they, they don't have a dog in the fight. No. These guys, Andy Staples and Ross Dellinger, not BYU fans. No. Kelly Ford's not a BYU fan. It's, this is a metric. ESPN's FPI has no fans. That is clearly math. When I saw the matchup of BYU and Alabama in somebody's projection, I'm just like, what planet have I landed on? <laughs> and then yes. you look around and you go, it's our planet. It's crazy. This is the world we're in. I'm not ready to go there to the college football playoff <clears throat> emotionally, but I am ready to embrace BYU in route Ross Dellinger's thinking as the sixth best team in the country by resume. Because who else has three power five wins? No it's one. Five and zero. Oh. No one. BYU stands alone in that, and these aren't just any power five Two wins. Two on the road. Yes, one of them at SMU, which looks better and better. You just survived the day game, which you couldn't win. You found a way at Baylor, and you destroyed what many people believe is the best team still in the Big Twelve in Kansas State. Yeah, I picked Kansas State to win the league. You and, and so many we got others. Hammered. So by resume, I have no issue with option number two in that list. BYU right now, by resume, is absolutely a top six team in the country with what they have done. Three road wins, three power five wins, two of those, sorry, power four wins, two of those power four wins away from home. Uh, the conference championship game is the next one that I kind of lean to. Like, if I believe BYU, there is a path to seven and two in conference play. Right. And seven and two may get you second place. It might get you there. Might get you there. And depending on the tiebreakers, because you have it already over Kansas State. So get to the top three, top two, and then maybe the math is in your favor. <laughs> the, the game on November 9th is very much in play up in Salt Lake. Yep. Um, and, uh, and then Houston here after Thanksgiving, Arizona State. By the way, Arizona State's going to host Utah a week from Friday uh, in the late game down in Tempe. And BYU goes there the week before Thanksgiving. We'll see what team Arizona State is, but right now they're one of the surprise teams in the league. Yes. And um, we're going to take over Sun Devil Stadium. Uh, they're already talking about that, and, and we're still weeks away from that. But, you know, anything can happen. Uh, we can get beat by any of these teams. Arizona could beat BYU. Yeah. Oklahoma State could figure it out. They solve their quarterback woes. Yeah. They get their defense Kansas figured out a little bit. Kansas could come in and do their thing. But they got to come into Provo, and that changes things. As BYU learned when they got beat at Kansas, they got beat at Oklahoma State. And, um, and, uh, and so, hey, welcome, welcome to town. Here's what I feel confident in with this team. They will not overlook any opponent. They have embraced the... Nobody thinks that we're actually good underdog mentality. And I'm, I'm excited to see what odds makers have for BYU Arizona. Yeah. Don't be surprised if it's like a one point differential. Well, BYU's got coming. a lot of problems, right? They're, they're not a perfect 5 0 team. Their record's perfect. They're not. So to have these things to fix and still have this, well, that's a good point. It's amazing. Yeah. ESPN's FPI, again, we mentioned it earlier, 24% chance that BYU makes the playoff right now based on what they're doing and the resume they have put together and a 15% chance to win the Big 12. I don't buy a lot of stock in that because they had BYU at... 4.7 4. 4. Wins, wins or something, yeah. 4.3. Yeah. They're, they're talking about fuzzy math. Uh, <laughs> look at those guys. But when it's positive, you go, hey, they might be right. Yeah, we'll yeah. see. Our <laughs> poll question of the day is this. And we go back to the three national narratives. Which of these three national opinions about BYU football are you most willing to embrace right now? Number one, BYU is a college football playoff team from Andy Staples. BYU is the sixth best team in the country by resume from Ross Dellinger of Yahoo Sports. Or BYU will face Iowa State in the Big 12 title game. That from Kelly Ford's metrics. All right. And the winner is thus far the Big 12 title game. Yeah. With 51.5% of the vote, most people are willing to embrace that right now, like you. When you pound a contender, you become a contender. And that's what they did against Kansas State. And then they backed it up 
on the road at Baylor, and now they have a chance to back it up in two weeks. Every mm. week is a backup week. But once you pound the contender, you knock out Mike Tyson. Everything changes. Everything changes. Everything changes. At Mo Knows BYU, great handle. On X, answers, is BYU a contender to play in the Big 12 title game? Question mark. Sure. Am I booking my flights now? Question mark. No. Is our resume on paper the sixth best in the country right now? Probably. Is BYU going to stay there? No, he says. Will BYU be a college football playoff team? Only if they win the conference championship game. My narrative is, I love being 5-0. and oh. <laughs> Enjoy the moment. Yeah, put your BYU hat on, walk around town. Life is good on October 1st. Better than we thought it ever would be for this football team this year is right now. Get to 6-0. and oh. Make another statement. Beat Arizona. Just keep it going. So yesterday at the end of... Uh, Kalani Satake's media availability, uh, even though he's heading into the bye week, they had his news conference. Um, he brought up a topic that was under his, you know, that, that's bugging him. Uh, and that is the, the notion that BYU's been too conservative, okay. uh, especially on offense, when playing with a lead. And we saw that against Baylor, BYU with a big lead and then hanging on to win. And that had a lot of people going, come on, what are we doing in the second half? Well, here are his thoughts to that narrative. There's this thought that, that we're not being aggressive in the second half when we have a lead. It's not true. Okay, so as we go through stuff uh, and, and we, we are not a conservative team, we've been very aggressive. And so in terms of, of conservative, we maybe we should have been a little bit more in this game, to be honest with you. But we faked, we faked the punt on fourth and ten, backed up in the second half. We threw the ball on third and nine, um, got an interception. We threw the ball on third and two late in the fourth quarter got an interception and um, and if, if, if anything we've had leads before and have held on to them Southern Illinois Wyoming Kansas State so when people are talking about our program and talking about our, our mindset we are an aggressive team we like to we like to find ways to make big plays that's what we're gonna do and in terms of being conservative I, I like to be conservative maybe that would have worked out a little bit more in this game if we would have done that but, um, you know, we're, we're working on it, too. But when we're talking about getting better as a team, that's for all of us. Uh, myself and other coaches, we can all improve. But in terms of trying to find ways to, to be aggressive in the game, that's, I've always said that from the very beginning. We're an intense team. We want to be aggressive. Um, but we're going to do what's best for the team in, in terms of trying to win. And maybe on this, this game, we should have been more aggressive when people are accusing us of, of being conservative. Maybe we should have been less aggressive. And more conservative so it's funny how things work you know I, I wonder if everyone's accusing Alabama of being super conservative in their game too <laughs> I, you know what Alabama fans probably probably thought hey where'd we go in the second half uh, you know they did because that's what fans think uh, uh, so the fact that he brought this up on uh, provoked uh, is he's clearly bothered by sure. it. Uh, would you consider BYU's play their style of play this season as aggressive or conservative I'm leaning towards more aggressive in general, for sure. Like, I think Aaron Roderick in that offense specifically of taking some shots, special teams, you run a fake punt on fourth and ten in your own territory in the second half, that's about as aggressive as it gets. And BYU had two special plays drawn up. Unfortunately, neither of them worked against Baylor for one reason or another. Some thought there was a pass interference call that was missed on one. And the other... Player just not really able to get their feet set, speaking of Parker Kingston. But there were aggressive moments for sure. I, I think that the thing that fans, be, and they don't understand the mindset and the scheme, and like, but from, from their perch, which is way outside the you know, nitty-gritty of what's actually going on, I can only think of one or two occurrences that maybe have pushed this, game, this thought specifically in the Baylor game, and that is one, when BYU ran the ball on third and seven in field goal territory and I think got two yards and it set up a fourth and five and then Will Farron came out and kicked a field goal, which he eventually missed. Right. So there was some frustration and there. And it wasn't which a is, chip shot. It was, it was like yes. 48 yards. So I heard some grumblings in the stands and on the sideline, like, why aren't we throwing for the sticks on third and seven? Yeah. And if we're just going to kick the field goal anyway, like – Throw to the sticks. That, that was the notion there. And then 
Then maybe, as Klein was referencing, they were a little bit too aggressive on third and two near midfield instead of when fans expected BYU to run the ball and keep the clock running or force BYU to use a timeout. They opted to pass it. It gets tipped up, and, and it's intercepted. Yeah. And then BYU's in some trouble until the defense once again saved the day. So there was kind of this mix. So I actually – I'm – I'm going to defend Kalani here. I think he's right. I think, generally speaking, BYU has been more aggressive in their play calling. Situationally confusing at times, based on the two scenarios I just brought up, but I wouldn't say that BYU has been ultra conservative. I think that sometimes they, they roll out some, some things that don't make sense to fans, but guess what? It doesn't need to make sense to the fans. Yeah. A predictability, sometimes the offense is very predictable, and I think that drives fans nuts. On second and 10, you know, 99% of the Good time, point. everyone knows they're running Good off Good point. Right you bring up, that's, the, so that's, that's another one. That's yes. a little bit different from uh, going Joe conservative. It's just, just being predictable. But uh, in that Baylor game, there was a time when two starting linemen were out. Uh, the whole running back core is a mess. They're playing guys that, that uh, are out of high school or back from missions due to injuries. Uh, and you have a young quarterback who's still figuring it out, right? Um, and so the things that worked in the first half when Baylor was on their heels, I mean, it was 21 nothing before they could even see what was going on. Turnover aided. Baylor changes their whole game plan. They're going to attack, pass, 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 which makes them look like the aggressor. Uh, and that's not what BYU prepared for. They prepared for run, 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 which is what Baylor prefers to do. But behind, they're going to, all the cows are out of the barn. They're going to throw the ball. And, um, and, then, and then BYU is going up against a team now with momentum and the crowd and the heat and all of that stuff in the second half. That changes things. You know what momentum did to the Kansas State game? It just took one fumble and it was over. Yes. Uh, in a boxing fight, momentum of just landing a random hook and all of a sudden the other guy's stunned and then, then all of a sudden Superman comes out and knocks the guy out and no one saw it coming. Momentum is a beast and momentum makes you look conservative if you're not the team with the momentum. And it makes you look like you're just hanging on, like you're trying to get out of the rounds. So you can go back to the corner and regroup. Um, and I think we saw a lot of that. And, and uh, even on the post-game show with the guys, it was, okay, hey, let's bring the anxiety level down and realize you're 5-0 and and you went to Baylor and found a way to win on the road for the first time in the Big 12. Yes, your defense in made the plays. Day and all that stuff. And it really didn't matter how aggressive or how conservative you were, you just won. Just like Alabama's celebrating, not that their defense went in the tank in the second half. They're celebrating they made one more play than Georgia. And that makes them better than Georgia, and that's what matters to them. So I think it's a perspective thing, and, and Kalani, I think, is, is trying to remind everybody, one, they know what they're doing, and two, what you see and, and, and what you think might not be matching up to what their plan is. Sure because of the personnel, because of the strategy and all this stuff, which is football. But fans get to do that because they paid the money and they get to scream and yell and, and write their comments, and the coach gets to defend himself. <laughs> That's how this works. Fans hate the run on second and ten, so I'm glad you brought that one up because it happened a few times. And it's happened for years. It just right. is just a thing. Situational. Analytics says we're running on Situational. second Situational, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that people hate that idea. Until it works. Until, Until it works. you break a few and then it actually works. But fascinating stuff. I actually think Kalani has some great points that he brought up there. And I love uh, the fake punt. And, and, and I love when they want to be aggressive. And if Parker Kingston wasn't thrown on the back of his foot, would have had a, uh, another touchdown pass to Keanu Hill. One of those two specials are going to go for a touchdown. Yeah. And it just yeah. didn't work out that way. So It's fun to diagnose all this stuff, uh, dissect it uh, at 5-0. and and 17th in the country. It just makes it, no makes it more fun to talk about. Uh, if you missed yesterday's coordinator's corner, speaking of the coordinators, defense, offense, uh, Aaron Roderick, special teams coordinator Kelly Papinga, they were on the show yesterday. You can watch that anytime on demand. After the break, I have my own one-on-one -on -one with BYU head football coach Kalani Satake on how BYU can win the bye week, what he believes BYU is doing best right now as a team, and his early impression of Arizona. This is BYU Sports Nation. This segment of BYU Sports Nation presented by BYU Food to Go, the MVP of your next event. Really good about where we're headed. I guess I keep saying it over and over again, but still some work to do. 
It's pretty fun to see BYU on top of the Big 12. Arizona looks really good. They beat Utah. We gotta stay humble. We gotta keep working hard. We, we gotta get the next one, and, and uh, that's what we're gonna be focused on. Get the next, and the next is Arizona. We are live in Studio B. This is your day-to-day -day BYU sports play-by-play. -play. I am Spencer Linton alongside Dave McCann. Yesterday, I had a chance to speak one-on-one -on -one with BYU head football coach Kalani Satake on topic, of course, impressions from the Baylor win where he wants to fix things, what he thinks of the national hype and what BYU is doing best right now, and his early scouting report on Arizona. This is Kalani Satake one-on-one. -on -one on BYU Sports Nation. Coach, I know that right after a game, it's hard to diagnose the things that you want to fix because you haven't had an adequate opportunity to look through the film and dissect each of the plays. But now that you have had a weekend to look back on a really important and satisfying win over Baylor, what are some of the specific things that you feel like we need to get better at, especially during the bye week? Well, I think just being consistent and um, minimizing the, the the, the mistakes. And when I say mistakes, I think everybody goes to like turnovers first, but it's just also like the missed assignments where we lined up in the correct position. Do we execute with the right technique and the right fundamentals of football? So um, there's, there's some been some mistakes in that, in that part. And I think when you talk about that, you have to give credit to the opponents. Sometimes opponents do things that, that cause you to make mistakes, but uh, we, we just need to find our, 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 our ourselves uh, when things get really stressful, going back to doing it the base, the basic way, which is a uh, simple and being really effective. And so that's going to be the, the key for us, just trying to minimize mistakes in terms of just shooting yourselves in the foot. Um, I think that when you get all 11 guys doing our job, doing it, everybody doing their job, I think good things can happen, happen for the team. Through the five wins and this 5-0 and start, what do you feel like your team is doing the best right now? I think they're just playing good football, you know. Um, I think they're playing really good complementary football, um, and in terms of taking opportunities and 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 um, being able to seize the opportunities when they come, you know. But there's still a lot of room for improvement in terms of just being man. There's there's just a lot of opportunities that we left out there, points on the board, um, big plays to be made, things like that. Um, you know, and I think it just takes a little bit, uh, a little bit of focus and a little bit of practice. And that's what we're going to try to get done this week. I mean, there's, we haven't played error free, uh, but we've played pretty good, uh, but we haven't even played at our best consistently. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to get done this week. What is your schedule like this week with no game on Saturday and you staring down Arizona on October 12th? Yeah. I mean, we're going to get early start in Arizona because they're, they're the next opponent, but at, at the same time, want to really work on on the stuff I just talked to you about, you know, being assignment sound, making sure guys get better and and uh, just be more in sync with what we're trying to get done as a, as a uh, as an offense, defense and special teams. And so the week though will be just like a game week except for mm -hmm. we don't play game on Saturday. So uh we're, we're going to work hard and, and practice hard and and um put ourselves in positions that to uh, you know, situational football positions um just like you see in games and and um, if we can do that and, and create some stress on these guys, I think that's the only way you can really learn from it. It's hard to simulate a game, but we can try as much as we can. Yeah, because there is no game on Saturday, and, and maybe you have already answered this in some capacity, but how much do you let your team actually rest in a week like this? Because you still want them to be sharp and ready, and, and you want to be consistent like you've been talking about. How much rest do you give them in a week like this? Well, I think I think you still need a, you still need the intensity of the practice. You can't just just rest them. I mean, they're they're, they're training. So, uh, part of the training is we worked with with our sports scientists, our strength coaches, is that we knew that we would have this by at this time, and we know what we want to accomplish this week in terms of our physical condition, and then what we have in in the future. So, what we have the next three weeks before another buy, mm. right? And then so we've we've taken all that into account. So there's things that we need to get done. And um, physical things, and there's things that we need to get done in the in the weight room, and then mentally, there's things we need to get done in in the in the classroom, and in, in studying the game, and and uh, making sure everybody's assignment sound football. So that's all that's getting done. It's just it's just extra work on Arizona, and but more focus on us this week as what we can do in terms of our assignments and our fundamentals and our development, and then 
uh, really, really get an early look at Arizona, but more than anything, focus on them. You had said that you were hopeful to get most of your injured players back by the Arizona game. Of course, this was before you played Baylor and sustained a few more injuries to some key players. But how do you feel about the overall health of the team going into the bye week? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's unfortunate the injuries that we've had, but the response to the injuries, um, running back and an O-line specifically, uh, I, I like the way the teams have responded from that. And, and, and um, you know, linebacker last last week against Baylor with Harry going down. Um, I, I, li I like the, the feel of the team and, and everyone stepping up. Um, but, you know, we, we nobody's lost for the season from this last week, so that's a good sign. Um, but we, we, we still need some guys to get better and, and then I think just having the guys know that they they could be one play away from being in the game, um, that 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 uh, detail of of studying and knowing what you're doing, and even though you may not get all the reps, you you can't can't just uh, assume that you're not going to be in the game. You got to just plan for it. And and sometimes when you over plan and it doesn't happen, it you lose the motivation to do it the next week. But I haven't seen that at all from these guys, which is a, a good sign, meaning that they're good, good young men and they care and they, they want to be over prepared, which is a good, good thing for me. Coach, the center position clearly is a critical one. Connor Pay has been solid to say the least. He's been very good elite in many ways he goes out with an apparent foot injury. And again, you've mentioned it's not season ending. What can you tell us about Connor's status moving forward at this juncture? Yeah, I think Connor probably let everybody know what, where he's at specifically, but I, I think it's going to be highly doubtful for Arizona. Um, he's not gone for the year, which is good. And um, I think the next few weeks will kind of tell, next couple of weeks especially, will kind of let us know uh, how fast we're going to get him back. And so that's... I'm 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 hoping and praying for for uh for uh success in 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 getting back, but um you know we have to prepare for the worst case scenario, um and so T J Woods and A Rod and everyone's moving on that right now. Great stuff, Kalani Satake is on BYU Sports Nation. I know it's early in the game, but you're getting an early start on Arizona. What are your initial impressions of the Wildcats and how they're going to challenge BYU on October twelfth? Well, you got to be ready. They they went up in in Salt Lake City and won that game. So then that's a difficult place to go up and win. So I think they did something that, that uh, an unranked team hasn't been able to do in, in some years, you know. So, uh, but but I think we're going to have a good environment here. You just can't count on the environment and, and the atmosphere and the home crowd to be your overriding, um, you know, <laughs> your, your, your best competitive advantage. We have to match because we know our, our fans will be ready for that game. We have to match it with our strategy and with our – our game plan and with our scheme. And so to get us in a really good position for success, but very talented team, uh, their defense stepped up and made some plays and it's hard to hold the team to 10 points like that. And, and, um, you know, and their, their offense, I mean, it's always dangerous with that quarterback that can throw and they, they found a run game, you know, against Utah, which is hard to do as well. So a lot of good things to, to learn from. Uh, we'll, we'll see uh, how they do. I think they play Texas Tech this weekend, so we'll be able to see how they play against them and and uh, get some more film on him and uh, on them, and then we'll see what we can do against them. I, I like a matchup because I think it's going to be very challenging. I'm excited for it. I'm glad they're here, and uh, looking forward to, to playing that game when it when it gets here. Coach, uh, congratulations on the success thus far. BYU into the top twenty. You have shattered expectations. So good luck uh, channeling. Uh, the right mojo as you handle the hype and, and push forward. And I have to ask, you're all about improvement. Has the dancing in the locker room improved as you would like it have over the five wins? For me personally, no, I'm not. I mean, I'm getting older. <laughs> my, my personal dances aren't great, but uh, the energy and the excitement from the players have been there. So uh, yeah, that, that, I, I'm, I love coaching these kids because they, they buy into everything we ask them to do. And, and that's, it's easy to, to celebrate when you know you, you, you did something really difficult and, first team to do it in BYU history, which is go on the road and get a Big 12 win. <laughs> you got it. Making history with each week. Kalani, we appreciate the time, my friend. Good luck during the bye week. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Go Cougs. Kalani Sataki with Spencer. You know, and whenever he's dancing, uh, something good just happened. Yep. Uh, especially in the locker room. It's bye week for the team. We've got your BYU football fix tonight on After Further Review. See all the big plays from the Baylor game with Blaine Fowler and David Nixon explaining why they worked and why they didn't at times. 
AFR streams at 7 Eastern tonight on the BYU TV app and ESPN+. Plus. Up next, a gem on this date in Cougar football history, memories of Pasadena. This is BYU SN. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Follow BYU Sports Nation on social media throughout the day. Great content on Facebook, X, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Just a few clicks will change your life. Yeah, just all of a sudden you go, hey, there, there's that interview with Kalani. <laughs> I want to watch that again. Change your life. Right there. Welcome back to Studio B. I am Spencer Linton alongside Dave McCann. Let's revisit what happened on this date in Cougar football history as we continue our celebration of the 100th season of BYU football. Dave, where are we going to rewind to today? October 1, 1983. Oh, yeah. I think many of us were in high school back in 1983, but BYU was in the Rose Bowl taking on UCLA. Let's show you what happened. Steve Young, the quarterback for the Cougars, he gets things started here with a touchdown pass. Wayman Hamilton had a big game with two rushing touchdowns in the first half. UI's defense was tough. Cougars led 24-14 at the break. Here you see Hamilton getting it. Hey, Steve Young, I've got an idea. Look for Gordon Hudson, your All-American tight end, and he did for the touchdown. BYU's defense, as you mentioned, Dave, very strong. They forced three turnovers. Lee Johnson, oh, yeah, old Thunderfoot added three field goals. BYU wins 37-35 against a UCLA team that won the Pac-12 and the Rose Bowl and finished their season number 17 in the AP poll. Dave, 1983 was unique. It was the only BYU team that finished the season with two wins against teams that finished ranked in the final AP Top 25. Sorry, two road wins against teams that finished ranked in the Top 25, UCLA and Air Force. And a great year that started with a season opening loss at Baylor, which they were able to amend last weekend. They rectified it. Won the rest of the games, and Steve Young still for Steve. contends. I went for that winning against Baylor was for Steve. That might have been BYU's best team in history. That was a good one, 1980. Let's get to today's headlines. Cougar football entering the bye week at 5-0, ranked 17th in the AP poll. Yesterday, Coach Sataki spoke to the media about what he hopes to accomplish during this bye week. With this bye week, we're going to work really hard. I mean, we, we, it's a... We're going to still practice. I know some guys will get healed up because we're not playing a game. Um, but um, this is an opportunity for us to get better. So we'll get back to work and practice uh, just like we do. We, we would do a regular week. Uh, the only difference is not playing a game on Saturday. The Cougars will play a game a week from Saturday, October 12th against Arizona. That's set for 4 o'clock Eastern on Fox. It'll be interesting, right? It's not a morning game. It's not a night game. Hey. It's right in the middle. It's all good. BYU wins day games now, Dave. It's we right learned where, that. It's right where the best part of the Oreo they, cookie is. How can you not they, like it? <laughs> they win day games. It's all good. That narrative has been quieted. Yeah, that's over. Kalani Sataki also gave an update on some of BYU's notable injured players. Specifically, no injuries to this point have been season-ending. Kalani said that he expects to be at full strength at running back, meaning LJ Martin and company are back. Sione Moa, Hinkley Rapati. All ready for Arizona. Connor Pay himself announced that he expects to be out for about six weeks. He'll have surgery this week on a broken bone in his foot, hopes to return for the Utah game by November 9th. And linebacker Harrison Taggart is also expected to be back for the Arizona game on October 12th. They're going to need Connor Pay's leadership at Rice Eccles. No question. Uh, we hope a speedy recovery for him. All right, here's some week five bowl predictions for BYU. Brett McMurphy has the Cougars in the Pop-Tarts Bowl against Notre Dame. ESPN's Kyle Bonagura has the Cougars in the Fiesta Bowl against Alabama in the college football playoff semifinals. Yep. Send him a fruit basket. <laughs> ESPN's uh, Mark Schleibach, Texas Bowl against Oklahoma. Interesting. And USA Today has USC and BYU in the Alamo Bowl. Okay. CBS has the Texas Bowl and LSU. Wow. I mean, but listen, dang. Pop Tarts win the day, Dave. So, and wouldn't you know yeah. it? We, we have been delivered two frosted strawberry Pop Tarts on demand. It's magically appeared here in the studio. It is time for so you to experience this. We talked about the Pop Tarts ball at the top of the show, and as a non Pop Tart guy, I can't even remember ever trying 
Okay, Dave. Pop -tart. It's time. And then you said strawberry. Strawberry and then, frosted. And then strawberry our boss, frosted. David Phelps just shows up with strawberry pop tarts like they're <laughs> in his bag. Okay, what do you think? It's like a nice, delicate pastry, yeah? Are you supposed to toast these or are you, you just can. Eat it straight? You can. That's what's the beauty of a Pop Tart is you can eat it not toasted or toasted. All right. What do you think? They're not bad. <laughs> They're not bad. I might finish the rest of it. Uh, Send those I, over to Dave. I endorse our friend <laughs> Brett McMurphy for BYU Notre Dame in the Pop Tarts Bowl. <laughs> a success so far, Thank yes. You. Yes. Yahoo Sports Ross Dellinger recently reported that the SEC, this is wild, and Big Ten conferences are each looking to have four automatic bids to the college football playoff when the next contract begins in 2026. Wow. Reminds, that's some hubris right there. Reminds me of that kid's book. Uh, if you give a mouse a cookie, they're going to want a glass of milk. Give me more. They will me never more. stop at not trying to have more than everybody else. That's just their, that's the, their instinct. If the, if the playoff expands to 16 teams, maybe that thought is entertained? Yeah, only if you get to 16, but not not 12. Wow. No, the others aren't going to with it, go with it, even though those guys are the guys with the bully pulpit access that sure. can say what they want. BYU women's soccer beat Iowa State last night in front of a raucous crowd at Southfield, 3-1. to one. Three goals scored to season high. Allie Fryer got the scoring started with her sixth of the season. She's, she's rocking been, the BYUS and Karma, by the way. Yeah, she's been outstanding. Mm. After Iowa State tied it up, Avery Frischneck scored the go-ahead goal with a, a beautiful setup from Mika Kromenhook that looked and sounded a little like this. Gives it a ride, far post. A ball in the net and a lead for BYU. It's Frischnick. Well, we talked about it earlier today, and we are talking about it again. She is phenomenal in the air. She wins any ball in the air. Kenzie Vance also added a goal, her third of the season. So the Cougars now 3-1-1 one, one in the Big 12. They were the preseason favorites coming off that College Cup appearance last year. They're just one loss out of the first place uh, in the loss column. They're one game in the loss column out of first place. They're going to play Arizona on Friday. Mm. They're coming along. Young team coming along. Yes. I, I said at the beginning of the season, so many new moving parts, so many injuries. You finish with a 500 or better record, this is a massive win, and BYU is pacing for that right now. Yeah. BYU women's volleyball drops three spots to number 20 in the latest ABCA Top 25 in spite of winning two Big 12 games last week. The Cougars, part of a four-way tie for first place in the Big 12 currently. They play at Arizona on Wednesday and at Arizona State on Saturday. Men's and women's golf are both at the Blessings Collegiate Invitational in Fayetteville, Arkansas. How about that name for a tournament? The Blessings Inv Collegiate. Who would yes. want to be at that? <laughs> the men's team's in third after the first round. Peter Kim uh, leading the way for BYU. He's 12th overall on the individual board. Angus Clintworth and Simon Kwan are among the top 25. On the women's side, they're in fourth after the first round. Alexa Odom and MJ Berrigan in fifth and seventh place, respectively, leading the way for BYU. All right, up next, it's time for Top 5 Tuesday, featuring the five biggest plays from BYU's 5-0 start. And Dave's got time to eat some more Pop-Tarts. Hey, there's two of them in here. No one told me that. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> this is BYU Sports Nation. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. We are live in Studio B. We have moved over in front of the big monitor to discuss some big plays. In fact, the Top 5 Biggest plays of the BYU football season to date. Five wins, five big plays. Let's go to this one, which was huge. Oh my it's goodness. number five. Miles Davis, he hasn't had a lot of opportunities this season. He got a nice touchdown the other day, but this is what he's being remembered for. On fourth SMU. down! Remember this one? Fourth down and a long yard, and he takes off down the sideline. This sets up the game-winning field goal, and BYU beats the Mustangs 18-15. to 15. Cruising down there. No one saw that play coming on what the a call. SMU defense. Nice pitch by Retzlaff just in time before he takes a big hit. And Davis running in those navy trimmed white unis. Looks sharp. There's a theme from Miles Davis. He's explosive on the edges. In, in the Baylor game, in the Wyoming game a few years back, and certainly on this SMU still play. Still have screen passes over there to number four. Get him out there in space and let him go. All That's right. number five. Yeah, so he wears number four. Let's go to the number four play, okay. shall we? Keelan Marion making some history of sorts at Wyoming. 
BYU's first kickoff return for a touchdown in a decade. This is the opening kick to the second half. 100 yards <laughs> down the sideline. Love the blocks at the end. And a notable celebration. BYU would win 34-14. This play, Dave, took any hope out of Wyoming's sideline. Totally just took the air out of the stadium. I wish everybody could have lunch with number 17. One of the great personalities on the football team and he had some tough runs his previous five one got to the 24 the other four didn't get past the 20 and Kalani said hey trust yourself trust your gap trust your teammates hit the hole he comes out and this is what he does coming mm. out of halftime when he was in there feeling kind of low and then uh, and he kicked it in gear and one of the fastest guys on the team but here he is kind of move goes, right hey, there. I was setting Ooh. up my blocks it's just kind of cruising along into the end zone for a touchdown. Love that. Fantastic. So while this wasn't technically a game winner, it felt like it. Yeah. That felt like at that moment, Wyoming was cooked. That's a sweet play. Let's go to number three, which Challenge? was a game sealer. Mm. So this, this was a game, game winning winner. play. This was a game sealer. We go back to Crew Wakeley's play. A uh, minute to go. Baylor's got the ball back. They need a touchdown to win the game. They got momentum. And uh, 100 degrees out there on the field, or was it like 120? Was it something crazy? 114 on the turf. 114 on the turf. This is the end of a long day for BYU. Wakely had a big sack earlier, and here he comes up big. He's playing fantastic. Might have been his best game at safety at BYU. Oh, and without right question. When, right when BYU needed it. Unbelievable performance by Crew. He told me I was I was begging to go to cover three. We thought it would work. Kalani said Jay and he discussed it. They decided to, and that's when Crew got his pick with that little defensive adjustment. Yeah. BYU beats Baylor. And we needed that one. We needed that one. Oh, in a worse way. Relief in the stadium because there were probably more BYU fans. Relief all over Cougar Nation. Cool. At number two, how about this defensive gem from Tommy Prassus, the true freshman? Oh, yeah. Scoop and score after the forced fumble by Jack Kelly in the middle. And he dances into the end zone <laughs> to give BYU their game-winning score. Yeah. Kansas State scored nine points. This put BYU at 10. It totally changed the tenor of the game. Momentum shifter, and it was all rolling downhill from there. For those who were in attendance, they, they, what you felt as we watched this uh, and folks talking afterwards, they just hadn't experienced anything like it. And, uh, and then the storm came because then there was another play and then there was another play and Kansas State's like, what the heck? Yeah. We're in total control of this game. And then Will Farron kicked the field goal and then they kicked off and then this happened and then it was over. 38 to nine. All right, let's go to number one. That was one. wild. 31 consecutive points in six minutes and 25 seconds. Speaking Historic. of wild plays, this one, uh, number one, came a little later in this game. <laughs> and of course, we're talking about Parker Kingston. It went from uh, the doghouse as he was heading there to the house as he turns the corner and then goes. We clocked it on AFR, about 140 yards on this run. No wonder he felt uh, sick. <laughs> officially, it was 90. Um, and he said he couldn't feel his legs the last 25. And then he went to the sideline and threw up. So this guy gave it everything he had <laughs> to make this play happen. And what was magical was right in front of the rock, up there with his hands. It was like gladiator. Yes. Are you not entertained? Yes. Well, you just couldn't have scripted that any greater. It was fantastic. Wow. What a night. What hey, a night. If you miss any of the interviews that we have on this show, or any of our shows, actually, they're waiting for you at BYUtv.org. They're there all the time. Uh, you can go and spend the whole day. Watch it <laughs> even while you're at work. There are no limits, Dave. There are no limits. <laughs> you can, watch you can, it on you can eat Pop-Tarts and watch them. Yes, you can. After this, which national narratives on BYU football are you most willing to embrace right now? More responses to the question of the day. This is BYUSN. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Welcome back with our poll question of the day. Which of these national narratives about BYU football are you most willing to embrace right now? BYU is a college football playoff team. BYU is the sixth best team in the country by resume. Or BYU will face Iowa State in the Big 12 title game right now. The Big 12 title game narrative at 50.2% of the vote is winning. Dave. I'll take all three. <laughs> yes. Our elite voice of the day presented by PAX Healthcare Elevated. Okay, so you got PPD 52 on X. If you're willing to accept C, 
No reason not to accept A. Meaning if you're willing to accept the Big 12 title game, you should be okay with winning that game and going to the college football playoff? Yeah, I love how he's thinking. <laughs> Today's Rise and Shoutout presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. What a weekend for Cougars in the NFL. Van Noy was fantastic. Taysom had a couple of touchdowns. Tyler Algier, give him the football, Falcons. Fred give Warner, another pick six. Pick six for Fred. The Cougars being well represented in the show. Credible. Our thanks to today's guest. For Dave, I'm Spencer. Shout out to Ethan Manu Maleona. We'll see you for after a further review at 7 Eastern on the BYU TV app.